Thanks for coming this afternoon. Um, what I wanted to focus on today came up in a conversation at Commission Junction. Um, we were at CJU and talking about the space, specifically about local marketing, and talking about uh, innovation or perhaps the lack thereof um, that we've seen in the affiliate channel. And local has a lot of possibilities for affiliates. And I think that what's happened is that social media itself and social media marketing has taken steps forward into the local space, partially because of the nature of how social is. But a lot of affiliate marketing has focused on what affiliates have always done, which is um, broader in sense than local, partially because prior to some of the newer technological advances, there wasn't the ability to scale local quickly. So from that conversation kind of came this idea for the session. So uh, again, thank you all for coming. Um, I want to send out a reminder that uh, if you have questions, because there is no hand mic out there, um, Please do text them or, or tweet them, and it'll show up at the at the end, so I can go through them. Or at the end, we'll, when we do get to the Q and A, I'll also, you know, try to call you if you can't uh, text or tweet. But if you can, that'd be really great. And also, uh, please remember to uh, fill out your uh, uh, session um, cards as well uh, at the end. So. Uh, Quick introduction, uh, I've been in the affiliate industry for about five years, currently the publisher of revenues.com, um, and work with a lot of clients like Keen Footwear. And, you know, that's essentially what my background is, just as the quick FYI, but let's focus on local. So Burrell & Associates, which is essentially similar to a Comscore type service for specifically for local market, their projection for 2011 in growth. And obviously everyone's interested in how big a market size is. So for 2011, they're projecting $16.1 billion in local online ad spend, which is a lot of money to go after out there, especially specifically because even though people are shifting their budgets that way, you know, there's a lot of things they're not being taken advantage of. The reason that that change is happening is because local advertisers are moving away, and these are small businesses, moving away from the yellow pages and newspapers and trying to take advantage of all these things they've been hearing about online. But they often don't understand it, don't know how to use it, or don't even have the infrastructure to, to implement it, even if they do understand it. More importantly, local is also a, a social movement. Uh, in the area where I live, I live in Seattle, not only is there small businesses everywhere that are constantly reminding customers to buy local, but that can actually be broken down into the communities uh, around Seattle. So places like Wallingford, Ballard, um, Capitol Hill, each have their own niche community and kind of not only just say buy local, but buy local in Ballard by local in Wallingford. So that niche has become even more micro. And it's not only driven by small businesses that are inside big cities, but it's driven also by agricultural communities whose farms and whose local producers will like their CSAs and so on to be, be able to survive as compared to larger farm you know, products that are, that are national. So, and this is just you know, one clip example, I mean you've got uh, keep, keep Portland independent, uh, you know, love Asheville, put your dollars where your, where your heart is, save time, save jobs. I mean, people are passionate about this. And as a visual example of it, 
you have from Nike's Just Do It campaign uh, with the skateboarder to a local company out of California get, making a big splash among the skateboarding community with Don't Do It. And the reason why is because the skateboarders want to feel independent from the closing in of the corporate culture around what they feel is their culture and not a corporate suit culture. And that kind of differentiation and that passion is happening a lot. Now, what you have to ask yourself in local is what does Facebook and Groupon know that those of you in this room don't know? So in 2010, Facebook spent a lot of money on local. They launched their platform places, and then shortly thereafter, they launched deals with 20,000 small businesses participating in that. It's a lot of money and a lot of development time that Facebook focused on that. Almost simultaneously was this battle with Groupon and Google about who was going, whether or not Groupon was going to be bought. So Groupon's estimated value, which I think is overinflated and a lot of people do, but was $4.8 billion during the time of this negotiation, roughly. Yet they turned down a $6 billion buyout offer reported from Google. Why did they do that? <laughs> there might be it, it's the truth. Uh, but I think the real question is, ask yourself, why is Google willing to pay $6 billion if it's true for Groupon, for a market supposedly only estimated $16.1 billion this year? And that's because almost everyone, and this is not just Burrell and Associates, are thinking of the market potential as a $100 billion local market, that someone wants a piece of the pie. And Facebook, Google, Groupon are all vying for it. But the problem is these are all large companies, with large infrastructure. How they relate to those small people that we just talked about who are in small communities or who are in specifically cultural communities who don't want to be part, like the skateboarders, who don't want to be part of the, again, business suit environment. And you have to remember that ultimately Facebook deals and Groupon are ventures focusing on offers and coupons. This is something that affiliate marketers have been doing forever, or at least since 96. They're not quite forever, but you know. Um, I mean, this is something that affiliate marketing knows very, very well. Why should Groupon and Facebook just own that territory? Here's an interesting quote um, from an ad age interview with infectious greed blogger Paul Kudrowski. There's definitely a $100 billion hyperlocal market out there, but the right way to see it is there are thousands of $15,000 local markets out there. There's thousands of these local fractured markets out there. Now let's forget about his math, because I'm not sure his math is right in that quote, but the, the issue is that there's all these fractured local markets that Groupon and Facebook may have the breadth to try to capture, but don't have either the relationships or the very specific knowledge it takes to capture the attention of these and find the gems inside these local markets. And I think affiliates do. So how do you start to get involved in the hyper-local market? Well, first is know your community. Uh, in Seattle, we have this place called Pike's Market. Uh, has everybody, anybody ever been to Pike's Market? If you have, Pike's is a great place to walk around and look at everything from flowers to handcrafts to books to occasionally, if you're not a quick dodge, somebody will throw a fish at you because there's a fish market there. And what's interesting about that place is every time I go down there, and I'm, and I'm local to Seattle, Every time I go down there, I walk away with a business card from someone who's created something very interesting there. And I walk away with that business card because those booths change all the time. Now, I may know that that local vendor may not be there at that same booth the next time I'm there. But if their piece of craft or what they've created has caught my attention, I'll grab their business card because I know they haven't stopped creating it in their home or trying to push it you know, from, from wherever their, their actual physical storefront is 
to where Pikes is. So, so start to understand what's cool and interesting about your community. A, a very easy traditional way is to be active, and of course one of the most easy ways to become active is to join a local chamber of commerce. The reason you need to be active is because the community itself needs to feel that you're part of what they are doing themselves. A great way to do that, and a lot of smart affiliates are, are starting to go down this path, are supporting local events, groups, charities, and teams. Uh, you can find example, examples on the um, Performance Marketing Association's blog of people like Fat Wallet, of uh, people like Mike Allen, um, promoting local uh, baseball teams, promoting local tweet ups, um, just so that way they can get involved with the community, uh, promoting local charities as fundraisers, so that way the community can feel that online, and these are the small businesses again, are not a threat to them, right? That online is actually taking part in the community. I think that that is the big distinction here about being involved. Also, find small businesses with interesting stories and products. Uh, one of the examples, out, again, out in Seattle is this ice cream company called Mora's Ice Cream. Everything they do is hand churned. Their ice cream is spectacular. It's, it's, and I'm a foodie, and I, go out, I, go, I literally drive 30 miles to go pick up their ice cream. Now, I'm excited because the first time ever, they open up a shopping cart online. They're going to try to package the ice cream and, and ship it. But it's very apparent looking at Mora's that even though they understand what a shopping cart is, they don't understand how to get listed locally. They're not showing up in Google search. They're not, they are not taking part in Facebook. They don't have a Facebook group. They, they barely used to start a, a Twitter account and they don't actually know what they're doing with a Twitter account. But locals, again, are driving that far for them to, to participate. And Mora's is using very traditional methods to talk about coupons and so on. I talk them up anyways. I would definitely promote them online. That's what it should be. It should be, always be products that you're you know, passionate about. And learn about hidden gems. And this is an example. How many of you either saw Twilight out of your own will or were dragged to it? Well, those who, who weren't dragged to it were lucky. For, sorry for Twilight fans out there. But in Washington, um, Twilight was filmed in a place called Forks, or was set in a place called Forks, and was filmed in, partially in the, in the, in the Olympic uh, National Park out there. Forks is six-hour drive from Seattle, which is the nearest airport, and is essentially a two-stop light town. Yet people got so passionate about Forks that I had friends drive out from Chicago with their kids to go to Forks. And then they called me up and said, hey, Angel, what is cool along the way that we can stop at to make this drive more worthwhile? Right? And a lot of these cool places on the way, again, are not talking about what they're doing online. So know those cool gems. But don't just think of local and community about in terms of cities and neighborhoods. Community can be anywhere where people gather and they're passionate about something, whether it's culture, whether it's sports, heritage, or just being social. Dungeons and Dragons folks who gather can be a community because these are, again, things that folks are, are, are passionate about. And one of my former clients, Joan Soda, made a lot of money through affiliate focusing Dungeons and Dragons Soda, a term that no one would ever naturally look up on Google Focusing ads where those Dungeons and Dragons folks were hanging out online in reflection of their local offline communities. Now, there's some merchants who have already got a gist of some of this and at least made good online communities that kind of reflect small offline small businesses. Cafe Press, Zazzle, Etsy have all started to take advantage of those communities who are, again, small businesses who have manufactured something, given them a forum to sell that, create an affiliate program and other marketing around it, and have been very successful at doing that. But there's a lot of underserved niches out there that I think if you think about it, like, um, for example, uh, uh, car sports enthusiasts who you know, go to those 
in, in Washington, every little small town on a Sunday, the whole downtown area is filled with you know, custom car folks. Custom fo car folks are very, very passionate about what they're doing. There isn't a lot of great communities that are around them. They're not just forums. So let's talk about coupons. And this, to me, is probably one of the more interesting data sets out there. According to New York Times, 3 billion coupons were redeemed in the US in 2010. 10% of those were redeemed online. That's a lot of coupons that you folks are missing out there. And that's a lot of market. And you're all experts at coupons. That to me was a staggering figure when I first came across it from the New York Times. What this means is the shoppers are still looking to traditional media for savings. They're looking for the Val packs that come to their door. They're looking for the flyer inserts on, on their Sunday re regional paper. They're looking to the little penny savers that come in the area. The coupons are still going that route. Again, if we're online space total, it's only capturing 10% of those coupons. So how can we impact that a little bit? Well, first of all, one that may not be completely intuitive is find big box stores with local franchises and promote coupons to their customers. Do that by geo-targeting the coupons, right? You can geo-target in Google. You can, to a limited extent, do it in Facebook. There's a lot of other ways to geo-target. Passing coupons to the people who are looking for things out there that have a big box tie-in is a great way to start taking a little bit of that coupon market. And a lot of those big box retailers are not necessarily doing that because they're, they're less um, versed in focusing on finite long tail. Here's another example here. Um, top 10 retailers by coupon search volume last year. Of the top 10, Amazon, who's number two behind Victoria's Secret, because, you know, lingerie. Um, Amazon, who's number two, is the only one who doesn't have a physical big box store on that list. Everybody else on that list either has an active affiliate program or is being promoted through someone who has an active affiliate program. And this is just the top 10. If you think about the long tail of retailers out there, there's a lot of retailers out there that, that, that can be utilized again. And again, to reemphasize, only 10% of online coupons last year were, were taken care of online. And you know people who are using these coupons yourselves. Focus on advertisers who adopt coupon best practices. I mean, if you're going to take the time with the coupons, make sure the advertisers are giving you all the appropriate creative, that the coupons themselves have information that makes sense to the consumer in terms of what the actual coupon is offering. Uh, you'd be surprised how many retailers you know, forget things like uh, what, when the coupon expires or what it's actually good for. Um, if you're going to take the time to expand this space, work with those advertisers who get it in the coupon space. On the local section, help local businesses beyond just franchises adopt offline and online options that they themselves may not be able to implement. Loyalty programs, a lot of small businesses can't, who are retail don't know how to run a loyalty program, have no concept of it. They may understand how to run a coupon in the Valpac or newspaper, but they may not know how to create a coupon online that's printable that can go out to you know, the people who are on their email list, if they have one, many don't even have an email list, or is printable in such a way that uh, can be taken advantage of via different types of online targeting. And then there's event-based offers, right, folks? Tweet-ups. If you're a bookstore, if your local bookstore is big enough, let's say Powell's, Powell's in, Powell's in uh, Portland, which is the largest physical uh, bookstore in the country, if Powell's is having an author in, um, I'm, right, I'm a book fanatic. I've got 15,000 books in my house. I've yet to see Powell successfully uh, and consistently do 
tweet up messages about what's going on with authors there. If you tie in a tweet up me method, message with a PALS coupon, because PALS does have an affiliate program, you can get some traffic there, and you can do that with a lot of local bookstores. Hastings has got an affiliate program. There's a lot of them out there. Um, and of course, the one that everyone's interested in is, and it's to me the cutting edge, because soon everybody will have mobile. Uh, I was just at CES this last week, and, and it's amazing how much smarter the phones are coming out on various platforms, not just iPhone, than they were before. But SMS codes, right, text codes to people, which are just you know, basic coupon codes, barcodes themselves in terms of scanning, and then of course QR codes, which are really important because of the kind of things that can be embedded in QR codes that you can't do in the other two, to me are really the f future of local coupons. But let's talk a little bit about mobile. So, again, the whole thing about statistics, you know, a lot of statistics are, well, you should take with a grain of salt, but according to Harris Interactive, 51% of consumers use their mobile phones for in-store activities. Again, I'm not sure so much about that number, but what's interesting about this graphic to me is the product types that they're currently already starting to adopt. Reservations for restaurants, for hotels, movie events and tickets. Uh, weather, they're obviously wanting to know if you know, where they're traveling to has got good weather. Clearance sales, pizza, of course, right? How many college students have gotten mobile phones? They're always ordering pizza, Pizza Hut. Um, clothing, fast food, electronics, music. Look how far down the line music is. Everybody's focusing on, on iTunes and downloads. Look how far the line, down the line music is in terms of offers people are accepting. So there's a lot more out there that's happening, and almost everybody kind of focuses on iTunes a lot. And of course, happy hour specials, back to the college kids. Um, you want to know what's happening in your local happy hour. But on the left-hand side, it talks about offer types that they've either received and used or, or at least become used to. And they're getting almost the opposite of what we talked about, grocery coupons. Um, they are getting apps that can s scan barcodes because barcode scanning is getting more and more in. They are getting some offers that they can pursue. Movie theaters, finally, are in the mix. Movie events is number two on interest, but number four in terms of the stuff that are getting pushed out. Travel websites, apps, ads via SMS, uh, again, being one of the lowest triggers. So when you're doing mobile coupons, I mean, everybody gets so excited about mobile, they forget a lot of basics. Uh, test your creative, guys. If you have an offer out there, don't just have one version of the offer. A, B, test that offer and segment that A-B test, just like you would online. Because otherwise, as you're running the test, you know very little about how effective your messaging is. And there's a lot of mobile analytics out there, um, new, new companies you know, sprouting up in the space all the time. Take advantage of some of that mobile analysis to understand what's happening so you're not losing what's happening in the path. If you don't have a lot of resources, I mean, SMS coupons are a great place to start. They're an easy place for small local businesses to start with, because all you're really doing there is, is, is creating a, a message. It doesn't even have to be a code, but a message that can be passed to someone with a phone, either directly or through Foursquare, or you know, there's a lot of ways to pass these. Um, you, affiliates specifically, should become very friendly if you want to understand more about the space with companies like Red Laser, Red Laser and their SDK pack. Red Laser is a, is a scanning company that's, that, that's developed a lot of technology around barcode scanning and have uh, allowed developers to, to utilize their technology to create their own apps out there. So, and there's a lot of other competitors. Red Laser's one of the bigger in the market. Understand what's the power of QR codes and the kind of things you can do in there. Embedding photos, embedding links, embedding price information, embedding lots of information that you can't just get from a normal barcode scanner. And that information is shareable as long as the code itself is, is clear. So you can pass that code in multiple ways where the consumer is grabbing a photo of it and passing it on to someone else. Suddenly you've got a, a viral way to pass information. And what's nice about it is implementing QR codes for small businesses is not super difficult because of all these companies out there, there are, are automating the process of implementing the codes. 
And as one thing that I always talk about is uh, consider developing a useful mobile app. You know, don't have just one function for your app. Try to make it so it's useful, it's engaging, it's providing some information back to the consumer. A practical example of this, um, Village Inn ran a promotion to increase the members of the VIP loyalty club. And this was just a basic SMS campaign that they ran. And the campaign was that for those who were using it, they'd get one free entree with their purchase of another entree. More than 100% of the offers were redeemed because people were passing the offer to friends of theirs that were beyond the list of the, the marketing channel that did, 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 did the distribution for Village Inn. Village Inn saw a 29.5% double opt-in increase into that club from that kind of campaign. Cheap, inexpensive, and repeat customers. Social media, right? And social media is one of the easiest to implement on a local basis. One of my kind of personal pet peeves from a marketing standpoint is don't use Twitter and Facebook and other tools as a dumping ground just for coupons. There's other ways that you can use those markets to engage people. One of those is to provide expertise. And the last two weeks, uh, one of the sites that's grown uh, exponentially is a site called Quora, Q-U-O-R-A. And part of that is because people are looking for answers to their questions, right? Small businesses have a lot of expertise in their area. Uh, uh, someone who's a small business who, let's say, is providing trail guides into Olympic National Forest, like in my area. Olympic National Forest is a 100 square mile area of, of um, it's the only um, tr uh, rainforest in Northern America. Hold on a second. Excuse me. Um, and guides are always taking tourists into there to, who know different trails, different routes, so on. Those guides could provide expertise online. Um, that expertise could be monetized in a lot of different ways via uh, supplying the people who are doing the hiking. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, so make sure you're providing expertise through whatever social media you're using. Beyond simple reviews of products, because reviews is an easy way to provide expertise, share your own experience and stories out there. And again, with Quora's example, you know, answer questions that are out there. And leverage those engagement tools in such a way to develop you know, further content. And here's a practical example. You know, I was talking about hiking, and I'm obviously a little bit into it because of where I physically live. But start a local hiking club. Create a Facebook group for, where members can discuss and interact with that hiking club. Create a Flickr page for that group so members can upload photos. Tag those photos properly. Foster discussions with local trails, on, on local trail safety and equipment, equipment being the key word, of course, in there. And offer promotional products specifically for the group from national retailers or local retailers and, sponsorship, uh, and sponsor events at those local retailers themselves. Because a local retailer who stocks such things as Patagonia, for example, in, in their product would love to have a local hiking group show up and I'm sure would not, you know, uh, either provide a discount or provide some incentive for that group to be there and maybe take part on a regular basis. One thing I, that I think is very interesting in the local space specifically is cause marketing. Um, again, earlier when we talked about people like Fatwall and stuff support, supporting local, sponsor charity events you're generally passionate about, you yourself, your company. Um, here at Affiliate Summit, Affiliate Marketers Give Back, uh, put together by Missy Ward, is focusing on breast cancer awareness. But there's a lot of specifically hyper-local charities that could use some kind of fundraising uh, online is a great way to do that. We've got the tools to interact with merchants in order to do that. Offer fundraising for groups and teams beyond just the charities, right? Uh, how many times have you know, the local uh, baseball or football team want to do like you know, a bake sale or, or you know, some other kind of fundraiser these days? 
there's other ways that, that you, as an affiliate again, can help support them and the, their parents and their families would be passionate about. Um, combine with social media tools like Foursquare, for example, to create buzz in terms of check-ins. If you're having a charity event, and who, who does a great job of this is Charity Water. If you're having a tweet up, you know, have the tweet up in such a way that someone who's actually uh, passionate from an you know, evangelist standpoint by using uh, data that you gather from someplace like Radian 6, for example, gathering that data of who's an evangelist for a specific topic, if they're local, reaching out to them and saying, hey, we're having this event for this charity organization, we're trying to do a fundraiser, who can you bring in in your Twitter stream because you've got you know, five, 6,000 followers that can come to this event? And of course, you know, what charity is all about is finding ways to give back to the community. One for sure way is those big box retailers who have franchises are always trying to find ways to give back to the community. And you can reach out to them and say, hey, co-sponsor a local event. Joan Soda, for example, uh, co-sponsored one of uh, the local softball teams in Seattle, um, specifically as a, as, a, as a fundraising event. A lot of other companies will do that, especially if their headquarters are in that community. Two examples of cause marketing that were extremely effective. Uh, South by Southwest 2010, Foursquare teamed up with PayPal and Microsoft. So you had some big players there to raise money for Haiti. 48 hours, it was a little less actually, after that startup, at, at, that team up had happened, 135,000 check-ins happened in that time period and the donation goal was matched to $15,000. Now that was a small donation goal, it could have been much bigger, but the big number to me was 135,000 check-ins in 48 hours. Check-ins are a powerful way, again, to drive people to, get, to, to want to participate in something. Um, specifically, if there's some kind of donation match for the amount of check-ins at a place or some kind of donation match for the amount of tweets at a place. Um, New England Grocer, because we talked a lot about you know, local and getting passionate in farms, um, uh, Hannaford used a points program in its 171 stores in New England to raise money in support specifically of local farmers. You know, talking about, do you know where you're purchasing from? Do you know how fresh it can be? And, and that in purchasing that, you're supporting your local farm. And they did that online to, to push that through social media and then gave the proceeds back to local farmers as part of that campaign. Now, you're asking who's doing some of this right. Uh, here's some of the affiliates that I felt are doing some smart things out there. Um, and I, you know, affiliate marketing is just one aspect of marketing, so there are, they do other things as well, but um, obviously this next and the, and the find have been around for a while uh, in terms of, of recommendation shopping and specifically in local recommendation shopping because they're getting better and better at focusing that down. Uh, Zaply and selecttogether.com are joint social shopping um, interfaces. So essentially you go to a local store, you try on a, a jacket and you say, you take a photo of yourself it pushes it out to the community, uh, both to Facebook and to the communities themselves that are following you through Zaply or selecttogether.com. And then your community comes back to you and says, yeah, that looks good on you, or no, don't, don't you dare buy that, because you look horrible. Um, uh, that happens very, from their test, happens very, very quickly, because those people who are passionate about, about shopping, specifically about fashion, tend to get back to each other very quickly. Uh, Point is an aggregator on, on, on mobile devices and aggregates not only uh, local area offers uh, via such things as, as Yelp and so on, so, so you know th restaurants and, and places are close to you, but then funnels in coupons and stuff via that, again, via mobile devices. We Reward uh, was founded by Isaiah. Uh, so Isaiah does a lot of um, paper post focused blogging where the bloggers are incentivized by large merchants to do the posts. Well, they took that one step further and said, hey, if you're a consumer and you want to try a product 
And you not only show yourself at the store taking a photo of yourself buying the product, but send us a copy of the receipt with the barcode on it, we will immediately give you a cash bag or a VIG or some kind of reward for doing that. Those to me are all very cool ways to get people to physically walk into the local store, because again, this is what local wants. And, and these are just a small set of companies, again, because back to that big figure, only 10% of coupons and offers being redeemed online. But there's a lot more that, I mean, could be touched on uh, data feeds. Understand your product data feeds out there. Uh, utilize good tools to, to bring in those data feeds that merchants offer via CJ, via LinkShare, via Google Affiliate Network, uh, and then figure out which of those products you can put in. Again, back to that kind of hiking example. If someone is, if, if the group tends to like Patagonia, if you're tagging Patagonia enough, figure out which retailers have Patagonia that you can, again, point that back to, to the group that's actually passionate about the product. Um, behavioral targeting. Of course, we don't know what's you know, going to happen here with the, the new f federal issues about behavioral targeting. But behavioral targeting is a good example of figuring out what somebody's very passionate about on a regular basis via use and then re-messaging them in such a way or, or, or in order to get them back into that or, or get them excited about that even more. Mastering your analytics. You know, we talked about that there was more than one analytics platform out there. In social, again, Radiant 6 is, is a great platform. People Browser is another great platform for finding out sentiment and engagement and where people are who are interested in products and topics that you yourself are promoting. Um, there's a lot of um, new ones that are stepping into the mobile space, and you're going to need some of those analytics in order to, again, not just blindly push out offers out there. And of course, using your web analytics, like Omniture, like Google Analytics, like in order to A-B test the effectiveness of your offers. Consider virtual goods. You know, uh, companies like Zynga, have started to make great inroads of getting people to spend real money for a virtual product in order to get a win a product like an iPad. That stream is because people get passionate about the games, want to buy their new cow on, some, on, on Farmville, and then because they don't want to take the time to, to play the game enough to buy the cow and win it, they go ahead and take advantage of an offer in order to get ahead in the game. So definitely explore those options because, again, I think Zynga's just scratched the surface. There's a lot of game manufacturers out there who are not monetized, who, again, don't know what they're doing in the space, but do know how to make games. Um, and speaking of games, consider immersive realities. The 3D being so big at CES, who's most excited about 3D more than the consumers are, is the gamers out there who want immersive realities. So what you're seeing is a lot more ads in games that are part of the natural environment where the actual billboard is from Pepsi, and it's really a Pepsi ad. There's a lot of game manufacturers that want to take advantage of that. If you ever go to the EA shows in, in Los Angeles, and a lot of these guys are small and don't have the deals with the bigger companies we're looking at ways to monetize their games. Again, affiliates have a lot of opportunity in local. And at, what my goal here was to, to create some, you know, kind of get some creative juices flowing in you about some of the ways that you can start to tap into local. And I think it, what it takes is community involvement, a little creativity. Sure, there's some long tail work here, but there's a lot of opportunities in there, and of course the desire to help small businesses and your local businesses dream big. And that's what I've got. Um, do you have any questions? Yes, 
Well, so for example, if it's a, uh, I'll use um, Pizza Hut as an example. Uh, if you are geotargeting, let's say Pizza Hut has a coupon. If you geotarget that coupon via Google or via Facebook, so that way when someone either does a search in Facebook specifically for pizza or in, I'm sorry, in Google specifically for pizza or is in Facebook and you know, is talking about a specific area, pushing forward that coupon to them is, is one way to, to reach out. But I, I think a more effective or a, a, a different example is um, if you have a retailer, and I'm gonna use uh, Kohl's as an example. So if you have a retailer like Kohl's who's got um, physical products out there in, in different stores, or uh, Bath and Body Works or Bed Bath and Beyond, and are running an ad, oftentimes their, their local ads in the newspapers in terms of coupons are different than their online ads. They may have sales that are similar in terms of timeline, but the offers are different. And so if the consumer is spending that much time grabbing those coupons from their local flyers or from their Val packs and so on, figuring out if those same merchants have offers that are online but are not repeated offline and then pushing them to those areas, um, again, via zip code targeting is, is a way to do that so that way it's not just repeating what the merchant is doing. Because again, oftentimes the, the offers themselves are, are different because they're being pushed out by a different unit or they're, they're figuring the, um, the cost of pushing out the offer is different. But some of the some of the the coupon guys have tied coupons to more than just uh, an offer, which is a, a click through, right? The the offer itself could could have a code attached to it. That's a physical code that they have to that they could give at the store. Um, what? In in those kind of cases where it's tied into like a QR code or or a barcode, you would. I mean, so it's back to the the whole situation of is the advertiser doing some of the best practices and sure of t tying in, if they're using an online to offline campaign, tying in that traffic together. I mean, if you, if you allow printable coupons as an advertiser, that printable coupon itself should be able to be redeemed in both places. And not just through a click. Well, you know, Lisa, I'm going to have to pass that back to you and say, and then they work with someone like Impact Radius who has that network technology already built into the offers. <laughs> but it was, I mean, it's exactly right. It was exactly right. It's partially the, the networks have the tracking ability. The, the advertisers themselves have the ability to, to credit it. The, there's sometimes a lack of either willpower or implementation to do so, but it doesn't mean that, that all those networks aren't doing that or there's not advertisers who are not currently offering that. And it's going to evolve even, evolve even faster. And you know, to do another coupon example, if you take a local merchant, let's say um, a local merchant who's a rug merchant who you know, great, has these great sets of handmade rugs locally, um, getting them to create a coupon in order to drive people into the store and, and helping them figure out how to, because you yourself are helping them set it up, implement that tracking and educate, educate either their uh, cashier, if it's an SMS code or if it's some other kind of code, or implement an actual QR code on the product itself. I mean, it's something that you could walk them through because, again, one of the things about affiliates is that we have the ability to innovate faster than the networks themselves are doing. Uh, 
that, do you, can you give me an example of what that local merchant was doing? Well, I'll give you an example. One of one of one of my clients. One of my clients is uh, Vitamin Angels, which is a uh, charity that provides vitamins to kids in third world countries um, who are suffering from malnutrition. So, and they are very good at doing events, but they're not very good at gathering data that I need. And it was part of the the training process. So, for example, they did. A, uh, a celebrity golf tournament they did in California and got a lot of press. Uh, not a single attendee did they capture their email or their Twitter account. So all this money around getting people there who are passionate about uh, about the charity itself. I mean, some of them may be passionate about some of the celebrities who are playing, but still were passionate about the charity itself. And that whole opportunity lost about. Um, Again, not gathering that information of the people who are actually intending. So what I did afterward as a post-mortem to that event was explain to the, the shareholders, and this, in this case would be the business owner, about what was lost in not doing that kind of data. Now, in your case, if the charity didn't fulfill the, or fulfilled the, the giveaway so much later than it should have, I mean, lost some credibility there, but if you then go back to charity and say, hey, you know, we'd like to continue sponsoring you guys, but in order for us to do that, is there a way that we can help you in terms of organization so that way we can either push out the product faster or make sure that the right kind of data is, you know, happening because oftentimes what ends up happening is that these people are so micro-focused on what they're doing that they don't understand that, that by not gathering people's emails and, and Twitter accounts, you've lost all that effort to do that engagement, or by not giving away the prize in a timely manner, you've lost all that goodwill that you created in the first place. You know, they, they need to know what was at stake as, as a, by their lack of action, by their lack of follow through. And sometimes they, they don't visualize that. Other questions? Either, either one on the far back. <laughs> Yeah, Groupon absolutely does. Uh, Carolyn Tang, who, uh, uh, congratulations to her, just won uh, Philly Manager of the Year at the Pinnacle Awards, uh, is, the, you know, is, is the head of that team. Um, Groupon does have an affiliate program. There are other Groupon quote unquote clones and competitors who are also developing those kind of programs. Um, again, utilizing them instead of trying to build infrastructure is a good way, but the, the back to that, um, kind of point that was done, made by AdAge, Groupon is never gonna own that $100 billion market because it's so fragmented completely. So there's always gonna be instances where you could see something successful maybe done by Groupon and use that as a test model and find out other companies similar to that successful test model and approach them directly locally. Um, you know, because Groupon is never gonna, no one company is ever, in the short term at least, going to own that whole market outright. Was there another secondary question, or were you guys? No, OK. Lisa?
Well, I mean, to me, coupons is just one acquisition method, and I, and I think that the, the, the companies who have lost their lunch on Groupon have done it incorrectly, have done it incorrectly because they either couldn't sustain the amount of customers who came in, didn't have the inventory, or didn't have the follow-up to make those customers long-term, because what, what was really brought in was a bunch of people who were just kind of casually interested and not really part of their real customer base. Um, knowing the business and knowing what's interesting about it is key to that. And, and to me, if you're giving an offer, but if you're giving an offer that's not to people who are in your sweet spot as a business, like, you know, if, if you're making a, an ice cream that's made from milk and you, you target people who are lactose intolerant, I mean, you know, you've obviously lost a customer there. Or if you are in fashion and you target people who are, you know, like me, who wear jeans all the time, I'm not your target audience. Um, knowing a little bit about that targeting is, is, is necessary, which is part, I think you get a lot of that from analytics and, and, and already ev sentiment evangelists, because someone who is talking on Twitter constantly about fashion and where, or, or talking on Twitter constantly, constantly about restaurants and stuff and where to eat are obviously passionate and knowledgeable about it. Pushing to those guys an offer that's a Groupon style offer or one that's less aggressive should pay out for a local merchant. Again, that's a lot of moving pieces there, but I, I think those, those, the velocity and the difference between those moving pieces is gonna go less and less as the technology increases. Um, and one thing that I realized I, for, I forgot to mention was um, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of, of calls and so on, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways that, that uh, we use this example the, during the conversation at CJ. Um, let's say you have a new, uh, you're a new condo manufacturer and you just build a bunch of new condos in, in your downtown area and you want salespeople to come in to, and, and you have your salespeople and you want people to come in to check out the condos and so on. They'll often run ads inside the newspapers to get people to call. Well, we have now a lot of tools at our disposal in the affiliate channel to to help people do that, that the newspapers aren't really taken advantage of because the newspapers don't have or haven't adopted online techniques in order to make sure that those calls are, are, are appropriate, um, you know, coming across. Ice cream, yum. <laughs> um, uh, there's a question out there. If you were just starting in affiliate marketing, would you recommend focusing on local as a good way to get started? Um, I would. One of the things about affiliate is, as an affiliate, ultimately you, ideally, you want to own a relationship with the merchant, right? Wouldn't that be the most ideal situation? Um, and the model itself is essentially just a monetizing model. So knowing more about that local merchant, especially because you have the relationship with them, um, and getting them to work with you on a performance basis, I mean, why not start out that way if you are just stepping into the space? The, the main barrier there is knowing the variety of options you have, not that it's local or you're just starting out. But I think if you do your research, I don't see why you couldn't. And I'm starting to get my five minute mark. Um, do we have other questions? Going once. Cherry Garcia rocks. <laughs> uh, let me tell you about this real quick because this was kind of applies to local. Uh, there's an ice cream company called Toski's Ice Cream. It's uh, um, one of my favorite ice cream companies in Boston. And people on MIT are big fans of this ice cream company, mostly because of its locale. Uh, it was in the film, um, that film that came out two years ago with Kevin Spacey about people gaming the, the 21 games here in Las Vegas. Uh, it was mentioned several times by the actual con artists. Anyways, we started talking up Toskies and threw out a challenge to Ben and Jerry's to do a local event in Boston and have Ben and Jerry's throw down against Toskies ice cream. Now, you, the throw down is going to be a you know Bobby Flay style throw down if you can put it together. And what's fun about it is it, the throw down itself will ultimately. Uh, be used as a fundraising excuse for, for a local charity. 
But for Toski's ice cream, not, not for Ben and Jerry's, but for Toski's ice cream, which is again a small ice cream company, the using Twitter to engage Ben and Jerry's in order to create a local event where you can have a throwdown in Boston in front of them, to me is, is priceless compared to you know, what you can do, what would they, they could have tried to do via you know, uh, advertising through traditional means. Taking that through affiliate, you could you know, take that as, as a step further in terms of, of sponsorship. You know, if you were running a, you know, or in the affiliate program for, for Ben and Jerry's, there's a lot of ways you can interact with that. But it was funny that all that all came together through a Twitter conversation. So there's a lot of ways that, that, that we can help local merchants, again, that, that, that they just are either unaware of or just haven't figured out yet because it's so new. And I, no more questions? All right, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much for... Okay.